Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Hello, I am Saurabh Sharma, Assistant Professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bengaluru. We are going to continue with Chinese political system, the party state. This is lecture number 12. So far, we have discussed the People's Republic of China, the administrative system and the provinces and autonomous regions, municipalities, the difference between People's Republic of China and the Republic of China, that is Taiwan. We also discussed the party leadership, the uh, in historically how it how it has evolved. So there have been different paramount leaders of the People's Republic. First was Mao Zedong, then Hua Kuofang, then uh, Tang Xiaoping, followed by uh, Chiang Zemin, then Hu Jintao, then Xi Jinping, who is the current uh, paramount leader. We also discussed uh, that paramount leader actually controls the, the party and the, and the military and thus controls the state. So power is concentrated in the hands of paramount leader. Of course, at various stages, there has been different, different types of paramount leaders. Some had absolute control, for example, Mao Zedong, and now uh, currently Xi Jinping has full control over the, the entire state, party, military apparatus. On the other hand, there has been a period of collective leadership, for example, under Tang Xiaoping and then Jiang Zemin and Hu Jintao. In between, there's Huo Kuofang, who was uh, the, the paramount leader, but he actually did not enjoy a lot of influence within the Communist Party. Okay. So this is separate, the paramount leader is separate from the head of state and, and the premier. Okay, Premier is like the prime minister, head of state is like the president. So at various times, different people have occupied this post and they may not be the paramount leader. Right now, after Jiang Zemin in 1993, the post of the president, the head of the party, the general secretary and the chairman of the Central Military Commission has been concentrated, concentrated on in one person. Then we also discussed the different constitutions of China beginning with the 1949 common program followed by uh, 1954 constitution, then 1975 constitution, 1978 constitution and the current 1982 constitution. And then we, we are discussing the ideology of the Chinese state, okay, which is Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, Tang Xiaoping theory, theory of three represents, scientific outlook on development and Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. This is a very mouthful uh, phrase. We have discussed four points so far, Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought and Tang Xiaoping theory, which is known as socialism with Chinese characteristics. Now, after Tang Xiaoping, the leaders have also come up with their own ideas. Okay, when Jiang Zemin was about to leave office, he, he introduced a concept of three represents, okay, and, and in, uh, included that in the constitution as his personal legacy to, to Marxist thought. Okay, so three represents means uh, the Communist Party of China should represent three things. They should represent advanced productive forces. Basically, this means uh, market economy, new technology, IT sector, and all the new, new economics, robotics, biotechnology. So these are all new uh, sectors of the economy and, and so it is unlike unlike the say the 19th century capitalism simply about producing certain goods uh, and the difference between workers and, and, and uh, the capitalist. Society has changed. Okay, now advanced forces have appeared. So there are a lot of white collar jobs and so that is the advanced forces. So Communist Party should open its doors for people from these classes also, not just limit itself to the, the peasants and workers, but also extend themselves to 
these advanced productive forces. Second is representation of the advanced culture. Okay, so new culture is emerging with a lot of uh, gender equality, you know, new music and new architecture, art forms and so on. So Chinese Communist Party should, because you see the, the uh, during the cultural revolution or the, the, uh, the previous culture of, of the communists was based on certain form of realism and you can see that in the posters. But now uh, with artificial intelligence and, and uh, computing and all that, uh, new technology has emerged. As a result, new culture is emerging. And so taking advantage of the technology, new culture should be cultivated. And culture should not remain the same uh, poster making culture that existed before, hand painted posters and so on. So there is a need to advance towards you know, uh, more advanced culture so that China can compete with the rest of the world and not be left behind. And thirdly, Chinese Communist Party should represent the majority of the Chinese people. So because the, the majority of the people now, are now entering into different jobs. Earlier it was, Mao has said that 90% of Chinese population is the peasantry. Okay, they, they are engaged in agriculture. But in the 1990s and the 2000s, it was no longer uh, the reality. Okay, majority of the population of China resides in the urban areas and they are doing urban jobs. Many of them are workers, many are white collar, are doing white collar jobs. So they are blue collar jobs, white collar jobs, all kinds of different jobs people are doing. So Chinese Communist Party should represent the new majority. Okay, so these are the three ideas that Jiang Zemin presented, they are known as the theory of three represents. Then Hu Jintao, when he came to power, he realized that, you know, a development is leading to en environmental degradation in China. There's a lot of pollution and, and, and there's a lot of international pressure to get rid of global warming. Okay, so reduce uh, carbon dio dioxide emissions, carbon dioxide emissions in, in, in China. And plus there is a lot of tension between, uh, you know, the, the different regions, the coastal areas had become very developed, while the interior was still backward, the urban rural divide, and then many other such, such uh, contradictions in Chinese society. So he gave this concept of harmonious society, which overall, he called a scientific outlook on development, that development should be sustainable, environment friendly, it should be balanced. So regional balance should be there, urban rural balance should be there, gender balance should be there, ethnic balance should be there, should not just be limited to the Han Chinese, but also the minorities should get advantage. So he tried to introduce measures by which a balance could be maintained within the Chinese society. Okay, so this is called the scientific outlook on development. In foreign policy also, he believed that China should be a responsible stakeholder in the international system. Okay, that is what the Americans wanted. And Hu Jintao emphasized on soft power as part of China's foreign policy. That China is a benign power. China's rise does not threaten the world. Okay, China would follow the international law. So that was the image that Hu Jintao tried to project. He believed that China would act through international institutions, unlike the United States, which, which was acting unilaterally. Okay, so he believed that United Nations was a platform China should engage with. China should uh, become part of different regional organizations. Okay, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, BRICS, so on and so forth. So uh, this concept is known as the harmonious world. Okay, China does not want to disrupt the world. China is not a revisionist power, but China believes in maintaining the stability and the peace of the world and maintain harmony in the world. Okay, so this was the legacy of Hu Jin Tao. So this was introduced, also included in the constitution, uh, just before Hu Jin Tao left power. Then came Xi Jinping. Now Xi Jinping, immediately after coming to power, he inserted his own ideas within the constitution. And this came to be known as Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era, quite long. Okay, in fact, it has very, very, uh, very little things that are new. It's, doctrinally, there is nothing special about it. What he is saying is, China follows socialism with Chinese characteristics. 
which was proposed by Tang Xiaoping. But a new era has emerged and this new era China has to make some changes to its uh, socialism with Chinese characteristics. And these changes have been introduced by Xi Jinping. So what are these changes? More state control. The state should you know, regulate more. They should, uh, so, so large number of Chinese billionaires have uh, uh, come into being because of reform and opening up. Uh, Tang Xiaoping had said to get rich is glorious. Okay, get, let some people get rich faster. Okay, so some people have become rich, some have become poor. So there's a need and, and, and they might become a different power center. Okay, uh, for example, Jiang Zemin had persecuted the Falun Kung, which was a religious sect, which has which a large number of adherents in China. So he believed that it could become a rival to the Communist Party. So he persecuted and banned the Falun Kung and, and uh, its, its, its followers were arrested. People were deprogrammed. And, and, and so, so similarly, Xi Jinping also uh, was afraid that uh, these billionaires and these new forces were going out of control. And so he believed that the party should control these forces. Okay, so he began with the party itself. He started the anti-corruption campaign uh, in which he, he uh, so this is the anti-corruption campaign I mentioned. The people who were loyal to his rivals were removed. The Shanghai clique and uh, the, uh, the Thuan Pai, these factions, the, the people from these factions were purged from the party. Anyway, there are a lot of uh, people are corrupt in Chinese system. Chinese system runs on corruption. And uh, so naturally, people are corrupt. And so uh, it's, it's often, uh, no, so long as they are contributing to China's economic development, they are not targeted. But Xi Jinping started this campaign because he wanted to concentrate power in his own hands, replace these uh, people with his own supporters. And, and, and so this was quite a successful campaign. The party was purged and Xi Jinping consolidated power in his hands. Plus, he also was able to control the productive forces, the, uh, the new social and economic forces that had emerged in China. Another important part of this reversal of uh, Tang Xiaoping was uh, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative or, or asserting China's hard power, great power diplomacy. So China, so uh, Tang Xiaoping believed that China should keep the low profile. Okay, he said China should not become a world leader. China should follow low profile, be very careful, not threaten other powers, not go to war. But uh, Xi Jinping believes that China has achieved a certain level of development and it is time that Ch China should assert its influence in the world. Not just through soft power, but through hard power, building the military, building infrastructure in the neighborhood, uh, you know, controlling the international political agenda, challenging the global economic influence of the United States. So this is all part of the great power diplomacy that Xi Jinping is advocating. So he has basically reversed these two important policies of Tang Xiaoping, unleashing the market and secondly, keeping a low profile. Okay, so there are many such ideas. We can go and talk about uh, the details of these, these uh, various concepts. But uh, I think this is the broad outline that uh, I have given and I think, I think it is clear now. So, so it is basically that there is a core of, of the Chinese party state, that is Marxism-Leninism, the leadership of the Communist Party. And then each leader who has come, beginning with Mao, has introduced some changes within this, this particular system based on the conditions as they have seen. And the latest one is Xi Jinping, and he is the paramount leader. So he has also introduced certain changes, keeping in mind the current conditions in China. Okay, Trying to concentrate power in his own hands, trying to give himself the authority to determine the destiny of China. So each leader tries to do that. Whoever is more powerful is able to assert it more. Okay, Xi Jinping is very powerful, so he is able to do it. Now let's look at the structure of the Chinese party state. Now this is a bit complex. Okay, so party and state are intertwined. 
there is a lot of overlap between the functions of the two, the Communist Party and the state, that is the People's Republic, there is a lot of overlap. Now let us look at them one by one. So let us begin with the party. Okay, so this is kind of a, a map, there are several maps that I am going to discuss. This is the first one. So you can see here, there is the National Congress of the CCP. So this is the highest body of the party. Okay, the National Congress, which meets once in every five years. So the National Congress meets and then it elects the Central Committee of the Communist Party. Okay, the Central Committee. It also elects the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection. So these are the two important bodies elected by the, the Party Congress every year. Now the Central Committee is a body which regularly meets once in a year that has been the convention recently the central committee meets and in the first session itself as soon as it is elected by the national congress it elects the general secretary of the central committee okay the politburo and the standing committee of the politburo okay and at that time the secretary at the office bearers of the party those who run the day to day function of the party are also uh, selected. Okay, so Central Committee is a very important body of the Communist Party. Let me let me show you this pyramid when this thing will be clear. So this is the hierarchy of the Communist Party. It's based on the idea of democratic centralism. This idea was first given by Lenin when he talked about the vanguard of the proletariat. He believed that the workers should be organized by the elite and it should be based on certain discipline. Okay, it's not like the political parties in Britain or America where you know there are con party conventions and all party members they, they are able to select the candidates just elect the can their own candidates and so on. For example, in American presidential elections uh, before someone stands from the Democratic Party or the Republican Party they, they campaign and, and they go to the members of the party who, who then vote. And the person who gets the highest number of votes becomes the candidate of the party, the primary process of, of uh, election. And then primaries are followed by caucuses. So it's a democratic process of organizing a party. Now, the Leninist party is not organized like that. Leninist party is under the high command. So there is a hierarchy. Okay. So how is that hierarchy decided? According to Lenin, the lower levels elect the higher levels. So the that is the democratic process okay each lower level elects the next higher level and then the next level elects the next level in this way a hierarchy is created and then there is centralism once the leadership has been elected that leadership whatever it decides has to be obeyed so it flows down from the top to the bottom the higher level decides the new level and the party workers are party carders not just anyone a any citizen of the country can become a member of the party. You go through a process, okay, you have to be recommended by a se senior leader, you have to pass the test, ideological test, you must be a committed Marxist. Okay. And this um, uh, uh, model of democratic centralism has been followed by many parties in third world countries. For example, in India, the Indian National Congress and even the Bharatiya Janata Party have followed this high command system. Okay, This idea was first introduced by Lenin. So the Chinese Communist Party also follows this process. So at the, at the lowest level is the party membership, the party cadre. Now the Chinese Communist Party is the second largest political party in the world. The largest political party in the world today is the Bharatiya Janata Party of India. Okay. This, is, this is a figure of October 2022. Okay. So at that time, there were 96.7 million members of the Communist Party of China. They could have more members, but there is restriction on membership. Okay, you have to be a committed Marxist. Here you need certain qualifications. Only then you can be party cadre. And these party cadres and then are then organized into various local levels. Okay, so China has prefectures below that counties, then townships and villages. Okay, the numbers have been mentioned here, as you can see. So these are the numbers. Okay, so these are the local party leadership. Okay, so the cadre are organized into different committees and congresses at the local level. And then these local party levels then um, uh, elect the 
provincial party level, the provincial party congress and the provincial party committee, they are all elected by the local level. So in China, there, as I have already mentioned, there are 22 provinces, 5 autonomous regions and 4 municipalities. There are two special administrative regions, but the Communist Party of China does not function there because of the one country, two systems policy. The Communist Party does not function in Hong Kong and Macau. Okay, because uh, the Communist Party of China is not used to participating in open democratic processes and therefore it does not function in, uh, in Hong Kong and Macau. Instead, there are some uh, pro China political parties, pro, pro communist state political parties which participate in the elections there. Okay, so, so there is no branch of the communist party in the special administrative regions. Okay, but all other provinces, autonomous regions and municipalities have provincial party institutions. Now these provincial party institutions then elect the national party congress. Okay, in the last national party congress which was held from 16th of October to 22nd of October 2022, there were 2,296 members in the National Party Congress. And this National Party Congress then elects the members of the Central Committee. The Central Committee has 205 members plus 171 alternate members. Okay, so there are two kinds of members, full-time members and alternate members. So together this is 376. Okay, so that is the size of the central committee. So it becomes smaller. Okay, the lower level elects the higher level. Then the central committee elects the political bureau or the politburo because central committee is also quite la large. It meets only once a year. So for the more regular functioning of, of the party, they have a politburo which consists of 24 members. Now, this is very interesting. It was supposed to be 25. Uh, last time it was 25. This time, uh, one of the persons who was supposed to be, because that was reported in the media, uh, part of, of the Politburo, Hu Chun, Hu Chun Hua, who was a protege of Hu Jintao, his name was removed from the list and uh, if you go to YouTube, you will see the video of Hu Jintao trying to look at the list and, and uh, some of the party leaders preventing him from doing that and Xi Jinping eventually intervenes and then Hu Jintao is carried out of the session of the party congress, okay, which was a big uh, incident reported by the media because Hu Jintao used to be a paramount leader and he was dragged out of the of the session and, and the Chinese Communist Party allowed it to be recorded and broadcast all over the world. So this was very interesting. So uh, Hu Chunhua, uh, it was believed could become the successor of Xi Jinping. But now because he is no longer a part of Politburo, he is out of contention. So he is, he, he is no longer a, a rival to Xi Jinping or a, say a replacement of Xi Jinping. So this is this was a this is a display of power politics within the Communist Party. Anyhow, so there are 24 members, so it's smaller than Central Committee. So political bureau can meet from time to time, once or twice a month it can meet. But for the day-to-day -day functioning of the party, they have even a smaller group that is called the Standing Committee of the Politburo. This is the most powerful body within China. No other body, whether the in the military or or in the state is as powerful as the standing committee of the Politburo. So this has seven members, so seven most powerful people in, in China. Uh, I'll, later on, in the end, I will give you the list of the seven members. The head of the standing committee or the head of the central committee and the most powerful person in the China, the numero uno is Xi Jinping, who is the general secretary of the Communist Party. So this is the entire hierarchy. So whatever is decided by the, the central leadership has to be followed by the lower levels. They have, they have to be implemented because there is centralism. So the standing committee, whatever it decides, the Politburo implements and then the central committee does it, then the national 
Party Congress also approves it every five years and so on and so forth. The provincial leaders party secretary are also appointed by the central leadership. Okay, so there is a centralized control over appointments of the leadership at the provincial level. Okay, so this is the structure of the Communist Party of China. Now let us look at the how the interaction between the state and the party works. So in this triangle, you can see I have already discussed this in the democratic centralism. So, so I have not mentioned each of the levels here. I just mentioned the National Party Congress. Okay. So the National Party Congress, it elects the, the general secretary of the party who is Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping as you can see here is the general secretary of the Communist Party of China. He is the president of the Republic of China. Here you can see the emblems. This is the emblem of the Chinese Communist Party. This is the emblem of the People's Republic of China. And he is also the, Xi Jinping is the chairman of the Central Military Commission. Now in China, there are two Central Military Commissions. One is the Party Central Military Commission. And then there is the State Central Military Commission. The members of both these commissions are identical. There is no difference. Okay. Xi Jinping is the chairman of both and all other members are also the same. But they are two different institutions. Okay. It is the party who, which controls the military. The People's Liberation Army is the Chinese military. It is controlled by the Communist Party of China and not by the state. Okay. But of course, the state also plays a role because the budget and all those has to go, 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 go through the state apparatus. And, and therefore, there is a state central military commission also. But because the people are identical, it makes no real difference. Okay. So, power is concentrated in Xi Jinping, the person of Xi Jinping. Now, let us look at the state structure. I have mentioned here, the central organ that you have to look at is the National People's Congress. National People's Congress is the highest organ of the state. It is the parliament of China. Okay. So, it also consists of say 2000 odds members just like uh, the National Party Congress. It is a huge body. It, it meets uh, one once in a year and then it elects the important organs. So, one of the organs it elects is the standing committee, which is a smaller body, which is about uh, 10% a bit less than 10% of the NPC. Okay, so this body does the day to day legislation. So it meets regularly just like a parliament of any other country. So the standing committee of the NPC it meets regularly. And then at the end every year it goes to the National People's Congress which has to approve whatever legislations have been passed by the standing committee. Okay, the National People's Congress also elects the President of China, there is an election and in the last election, Xi Jinping received 100% of the votes from the National People's Congress. So it is not really an election, just a rubber stamp. It is already decided by the leader who is going to be leader. So Xi Jinping decided that Xi Jinping is going to be elected and all other members had to vote for him. The Vice President also was um, elected vice president is uh, Hang Chang. Hang Chang is the vice president. Let me write his name here. Hang Chang is the vice president. He received a couple of votes less. So, few people abstained from voting. Okay, He also received almost all the votes, but he has to be less than Xi Jinping. He cannot be as popular as Xi Jinping. So, a few people did not vote. Okay. So, this is very, this is the typical dictatorship. Okay. So, elections do not have any meaning. These are just rubber stamps. Now, the National People's Congress, just like the National Party Congress, the people are sent from the, the lower levels. Okay. They are the provinces, then they are the special units, departments, uh, the PLA, minorities, different constituencies, they send their members. Also, members from other Democratic parties are also part of the National People's Congress. There is all another body known as Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference. I have already mentioned this, CPPCC. 
Now CPPCC, you can see here CPPCC. It is a consultative body. It is not, it does not really have any execute power of execution, okay, or, or legal authority. But CPPCC was created by the communist under Mao Zedong as a representative of the United Front. Now I had told you about the new democracy concept. So Mao Zedong believed that in China the revolution would come through the a united front of the communist and other parties which, which represent other classes. Okay, so that is known as the united front. The first united front was formed in 1923 between the Kuomintang and the, the communist through the mediation of the Com intern, communist international. And uh, it lasted till 1927. It was under the leadership of Sun Yat-sen when the communist had joined the, the Kuomintang. So, Communists were a junior partner to the Kuomintang, which were the who were the nationalists. Okay. Once uh, Sun Yat-sen died, Chiang Kai-shek he became the leader of the Kuomintang. He was anti-communist, so he, after the Northern Expedition where he reunited China, almost, uh, he purged the Kuomintang from the communists and then persecuted the communists. And the communists then had to then go for the long march. And ultimately, they formed a base in Yan'an where Mao Zedong emerged as the leader of the communists. So that is a united front. The second united front was created when Japanese invaded China. So Japanese first invaded China in 1931 when they captured uh, Manchuria. They created a pu puppet regime called Manchukuo. But then in 1937, they attacked China proper. And uh, uh, Chiang Kai-shek was forced uh, to form an alliance with the communists. So that is known as the Second United Front, when they came together to resist the Japanese aggression. And this fell, fell apart in 1945. And uh, in the civil war, of course, the Kuomintang was defeated and communists came to power. But uh, instead of establishing a dictatorship of the Communist Party, which actually it was, but but in form it wasn't because Mao Zedong formed an alliance with eight other so-called democratic parties. Okay, one of them, the Revolutionary Committee of the Kuomintang. So it's a breakaway group of Kuomintang led by the widow of Sun Yat-sen, as I told you. So, so they came together, all these parties, in what is known as the CPPCC. And there they adopted the 1949 common program and which became the governing document of the People's Republic. So CPPCC plays a very important role. CPCC has been retained even after that. So there is a session of the National People's Congress along with it there is a session of the CPPCC also which discusses policies, new ideas are floated. So it's a consultative kind of a body, while National People's Congress is the legislative body. In a sense, you can call CPCCC as a uh, CPPCC as a upper house, just like a House of Lords, something like that. Although legislation does not go from N NPC to CPPCC, it's the other way around. Discussions and consultation happen in the uh, CPPCC, and then the legislation is done in the NPC. So that is the legislative branch of the government. Then the executive branch, which is headed by the president, of course, already mentioned. But then there is the state council, which is like the council of ministers in, in democratic countries. So the premier is the head of the state council. The premier is nominated by the president and then approved by the NPC. Okay, and then the premier then gives the name, suggests the names of ministers within the state council, which are then approved by the NPC. So all the positions have to be approved by the NPC. But again, as I told you, it's just a rubber stamp. So there's a premier and the state council, which run the various departments. There are the bureaucrats who come under this. Then there are some other bodies, very interesting. There is a National Super, Supervisory 
Commission. This is like the control yuan in Taiwan. I had already mentioned Sun Yat-sen believed that there should be separation of power. So instead of the classical three branches of government, he suggested that there should be five. The legislative yuan, the executive yuan, the judicial yuan, the control yuan and the examination yuan. So National Supervisory Commission is just like the control yuan. It, look, it looks into the corruption cases, the ombudsman basically, looks at the appointments of, of various officials. Uh, in India, you can say there's a UPSC, vigilance, kind of a mixed type of a Lokpal. It's a mixed kind of a body. But of course, everything is directly under the control of the party leader. So whatever the party leader decides has to be implemented. So uh, this, this institution played an important role in the anti-corruption campaign. Then there is the judiciary. So judiciary, the highest judiciary is the Supreme People's Court. So in a communist country, there is no independent judiciary. The judiciary is under the communist party and it is elected by the National People's Congress. Every five years, the judges, the, the chief justice, which is the chairman of this body, all are elected by National People's Congress. So long as they, they are loyal to the communist party, they get re-elected. Okay, that is the Supreme People's Court, the highest judiciary. Then there is an interesting institution, Supreme People's Procuratorate. This is the prosecuting agency. So this agency is also elected by the National People's Congress. Uh, in India, say the prosecution is determined by the state government. While in the United States, the, the district attorney and the, and the prosecution is actually, the district attorney is elected by the people. So there are different ways of appointing it. In, in, in China, it is the NPC that elects the prosecution. So the prosecution is elected by the same body, the court is elected by the same body and therefore whatever investigation is done, whatever prosecution is, whatever evidence the prosecution presents, what would be the result? The prosecution rate would be excellent. Almost 100% of the cases would be won by the prosecution because it is all within the party. It is the party which uh, tables the evidence. It is the party which decides the cases. Okay. So there is no independent judicial or legal system within China. Okay. So this is the nature of a one party communist dictatorship. Now within the party, there is another institution that is the Central Commission for Discipline inspection. This is like a big brother to the National Supervisory Commission, more powerful than National Supervisory Commission because this is the state body. It used to be known as the Control Commission. So who would be the candidates that who will stand for elections? Who will do the background check? Because the Xi Jinping cannot sit and you no know, go through the list like Stalin went through the list and then decided who would be executed and who not. Xi Jinping does not have the time to go through all the candidates and he does not have enough information for all that. So it is the this particular commission, Central Commission for Discipline Inspection, which goes through the party, party membership. It, it In case someone goes against the party ideology, their disciplinary action against them. Okay, so the power of controlling the party resides with the discipline inspection. Okay, so this is how the electoral process happens. It is this body which decides on the candidates. Always there are more candidates than the seat so that there would be some form of election. But ultimately it is all rubber stamp. They can have less candidates, they can have equal number of candidates, it does not matter in the end. Okay, because who would be the preferred candidates are already decided. Who will be the president is decided, who would be the premier would be decided. So these are all decided by the paramount leader and implemented by the Central Commission for Discipline inspection. Okay, so this is the structure of the Chinese Communist Party state. I hope this was clear. Now let's look at the current members of the standing committee. So this is the current leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, this was uh, in decided in 2022 October, as I have already mentioned. So in the 20th Party Congress. The 20th Party Congress 
National Party Congress has the 28th Central Committee, which has the 28th Politburo. Okay. So, you can see the list and this is in a order of rank. The highest ranked official of the Chinese Communist Party is Xi Jinping, who is the General Secretary of the Chinese Communist Party. He is the Chairman of the Central Military Commission and he is the President of the People's Republic of China. Number two is Li Qiang, who is the Premier of the People's Republic of China. He heads the State Council, so he runs the day to day administration. He is like the Prime Minister. So, he is number two. Now, for a time, number three, the chairman of the Standing Committee of National People's Congress, this is like the speaker of the parliament. Uh, for a period, the chairman of the NPC used to be number two. Okay. So, when uh, Li Peng was the, I mentioned Li Peng before. Uh, he used to be the premier from 1987 to 1998. He was the premier of the uh, state council or the premier of China. So, in 1998, he was made the chairman of the standing committee of the NPC. He was the number two in that position. The premier Chu Rongqi was number three. Okay. Later on, this was reversed and the premier became number two okay so these things can be decided according to you know who who is more powerful who is senior and these are all decided by the party leadership so right now chao le chi is the chairman of the standing committee this is like the speaker of the say in india lok sabha house of commons house of representatives something like that then number four is the chairman of cppcc that is number four, Wang Hu Ning. Wang Hu Ning is the number four. Okay, he is the chairman of the CPPCC. So, CPPCC is considered to be a very important institution. Although it does not have any power of execution or some kind of legislative power, as a consultative body, it is very important and it is very important to maintain a united front. Un Communist Party always places emphasis on united front. Because they have this concept, you know, democracy. They want to present themselves as democracy. Therefore, it's people's democracy. So they say our democracy is better. People's democracy is better than the uh, representative democracy in in the democratic countries like India, according to them. Uh, so United Front is always important. Uh, for example, uh, during the Yan'an Yan'an period, when uh, Mao Zedong was the head of the uh, military, the PLA. Wang Ming, one of the 28 Bolsheviks, was in charge of the United Front. Now, there are three leaders. There are Time Barret who ruling over the Communist Party. So, one of them was Wang Ming, who was uh, head of the United Front Department. So, yes, the, the, the Communist Party still has a United Front Department, which is represented uh, uh, kind of a, which, which, uh, controls the functioning of the CPP CC. Okay. Number four, Wang Huning. Then number five is Chai Chi. Chai Chi is number five. He is the first secretary of the secretariat of the Chinese Communist Party and director of the general office of the Chinese Communist Party. Basically, he is the CEO who runs the office of Xi Jinping. Okay, the general secretary himself, of course, does not run the office. Under him, he has his first secretary. For example, in India, we have the PMO, Prime Minister's Office. So, Narendra Modi is the Prime Minister, but his office is run by the Principal Secretary. So, there is a Principal Secretary to the Prime Minister who has a cabinet rank. Mr. Pramod Kumar Mishra is the Principal Secretary to the Prime Minister of India. Before that, it was Mr. Nipendra Mishra. Okay, they, they have been, uh, they were given cabinet uh, ranks. Okay, National Security Advisor Ajit Doval also has a cabinet rank. So, that is the Prime Minister's office. So, similarly, in, in uh, China, there is the Secretariat of the Chinese Communist Party because there is no separation between the state and the party. The party is the state. And then there is a general office. Okay, so, the, Chai Chi is the head of this particular office, the first secretary and the director. Then number six is Ting Sui Xiang. 
Okay, he is the first rank vice premier of the state council. This is like the deputy prime minister. Okay, so there are several vice premiers in the state council, and uh, they are ranked first, second, so on. So he is the first rank vice premier. So from the state. Uh, council, we have two people, the premier and one vice premier. And then number seven is Li Si. Li Si is the secretary of the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection. As I told you, it is a very powerful body, Li Shi. Okay. So Li Ka Chiang, he used to be premier. He was retired in, the, in 2022 and 2023, he retired as the premier, while Xi Jinping has continued into his third term of office. So that, that, that's a kind of a brief explanation of the Chinese political system. Let me for your uh, sake summarize the discussion that we had so far. Okay. So we discussed the uh, People's Republic of China and the Republic of China. There are two different entities separated by the Taiwan Straits. Okay. So there is a one China policy. A People's Republic of China wants to reintegrate Taiwan with the rest of China. Okay, so it considers Taiwan to be a province of China. In fact, a province of the People's Republic of China. While uh, Taiwan considers itself to be the Republic of China, the legitimate entity that should rule over whole of China. That is known as the One China policy. So a country can either recognize or have diplomatic relations with People's Republic of China or with the Republic of China, one of them, not both. Okay. So in, in, in Taiwan, there is the Democratic People's Party, which advocates for separation. It believes that there, uh, Taiwan should get independence. Of course, it does not have a majority support yet. So they have not taken any, any uh, stand in that particular direction, especially in this particular uh, tenure of, of, of them in power. Anyhow, so we will not go into details of Taiwan right now. Then we discuss the leadership of the Communist Party. As I told you, there is a paramount leader. Okay, the first paramount leader was Mao Zedong, who may be different from the head of the Communist Party. Okay, like for example, Tang Xiaoping was the paramount leader, but he was never the head of the Communist Party. And in recent years, we have these three, Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao and Xi Jinping. Xi Jinping is the current paramount leader. He is also the head of the party. He is also the head of the state. Okay. And the premier is Li Qian. Okay. So that is the, that is how the leadership of the party state functions. Then I discuss about the various constitutions of the People's Republic of China. I won't uh, repeat them again. And then we discuss the, the ideology of the Communist Party state, Marxism, Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, Tang Xiaoping theory, theory of three represents scientific outlook on development and Xi Jinping thought on socialism with Chinese characteristics for a new era. Okay, this we discussed in details. And then we have discussed the, in this particular lecture, the structure of the Communist Party, okay, the various institutions, how they are elected. See here, I have mentioned through arrows who elects them. And we also discuss the structure of the state. And then we discuss the current leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. Thus, the People's Republic of China is a one party dictatorship of the Communist Party. Unlike, say, a democratic country, it does not have free and fair elections. So, there are elections, as I told you, but these elections are all predetermined by the leadership, who, was, who, are, who are the candidates, uh, who is going to get elected. So these are all already determined by the party leadership. Uh, although there is universal suffrage and everyone above the 18 years of age can has the right to vote, all these are provided in the constitution. The constitution also provides for fundamental rights, the freedom of speech, freedom of religion, so on and so forth. But it is not actually practiced in, in, in a communist country. These are just in letter and not in practice. Say for example, freedom of speech. You cannot criticize the leader of the communist party. You cannot criticize the communist party. 
Okay. In fact, uh, Chinese uh, uh, people on the internet, they try to use uh, indirect means of, of uh, making fun of the leaders. For example, Winnie the Pooh uh, was used as a representative of Xi Jinping. And so what did the uh, party do? They banned the cartoon itself. Winnie the Pooh, that cartoon character was banned from Chinese media altogether completely because Xi Jinping looks like a bit like Winnie the Pooh. I mean, I mean basically he's a round fat man and so like Winnie the Pooh in that sense. Freedom of religion. Okay, so there are certain recognized religions. Uh, Taoism, Buddhism, Catholicism, Protestantism and Islam. These are the five recognized religions. You cannot practice any other religion. You may be allowed in a sense, uh, say in, in, in uh, the foreigners going to China may uh, uh, do some kind of a worship privately, but, but you are not allowed to propagate or you cannot sell religious literature openly in China. Okay, so you can say Hinduism, you cannot preach, go, go and preach Hinduism in China. Okay, so, I, so there is restriction. Falun Gong is the most famous example. It was the largest uh, growing religious sect in China. It was becoming very, very popular. It had over a million members. It was banned because uh, uh, the Chinese Communist Party did not want any rival in terms of membership. Okay. What is happening in Xinjiang province of China, where the Muslims are being held in uh, concentration camps? It says that about 1 million of them are put there. Kazakh and Uyghur uh, Muslims have been put there. They are being indoctrinated. They have been asked uh, not to follow Islam strictly. There are prohibitions on Islamic names. Okay, so all these things are done uh, in, in China. There, rest, there is a restriction on freedom of speech, although freedom of religion and freedom of speech, although these are provided by the constitution. Similarly, right to vote is provided, but that is also restricted in China. Gender equality. Okay, China, it's a communist society. Uh, Mao Zedong had said that women and uh, men hold one half each of the sky. Okay, they are holding the sky, both of them. But you see the leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. There is no women in the leadership. Okay, they do some tokenism and include uh, some women. Okay, so there is right to equality in China, but women are not given any rights. Okay, homosexuality is uh, criminalized in China. Okay, you are not able to follow what you want. In fact, China used to have a one-child policy from 1979 onwards. So you could not have uh, as many children as you wanted. Well, there were strict fines on, on, on having more than one children. As a result, China's demography has, uh, has re reached a crisis because of uh, lack of children. In fact, uh, because parents preferred male child, the gender ratio has, uh, has, has become skewed in favor of male. There are less number of females. As a result, now many men uh, have to go unmarried. They don't find wives because uh, there is a lack of women in China. Under Xi Jinping recently, they have relaxed a one child policy to two child policy. And now they have made it a three child policy. And in fact, now there is talk that people can have as many children as they want because China's population has begun to decline. Now, India has become recently the largest population in the world. China has become number two. And it is predicted that uh, uh, within about 50 to 100 years, China's population will decline steeply. Okay, because uh, the number of old people has increased and young, young people, their population is less in China. And this is the youngsters who are going to have children in the next generation. And because they are less, so number of children will also be less. As a result, when the old generation dies, the population of China will decline. So these are all par mistakes made by, you know, our dictatorship. Mao Zedong, he made so many mistakes. Okay, his whole great leap forward led to death of 30 million people or more. Uh, uh, the Cultural Revolution, it was, it was a, a movement that created chaos in China. It did not achieve anything. In fact, it created a lost decade when an entire generation was not able to uh, study according to merit there to go to the countryside to learn from the peasants, which was a complete waste instead of going to universities and learning engineering and medicine and science and technology, they, they, they 
uh, wasted their time in revolutionary activities. His 100 flowers movement was a sham. It basically was uh, launched to, to identify critiques of, of his. Okay, and he used it to launch an anti rightist campaign and persecute the intellectuals. So, Xi Jinping now, uh, you know, concentrating power in his own hands and becoming uh, like Mao Zedong, as powerful as Mao Zedong, is, is dangerous because uh, people will be afraid to speak truth to him. When there was a collective leadership, there were different opinions. So, even if the leader had a wrong opinion, he could learn from the colleagues. If there is only one person who is supreme and everyone else is scared to speak against him, then uh, opposite views won't come. Like in a, uh, in a, in a democracy, when there is a council of ministers, the prime minister sits and takes uh, advice from uh, ministers, and the bureaucrats and they are able to speak and there is an opposition which criticizes. Okay, in India, for example, there was the farm bills, three farm bills law uh, passed by the parliament, but because there were protests, the prime minister uh, declared that they will be withdrawn and they were withdrawn. Okay, rightly or wrongly, in, in a democracy decisions are overturned because of criticism. This cannot happen in China. Maybe under Tang Xiaoping, what, what system he established, this may have been possible because of collective leadership. But once power is concentrated in the hand of one person, then there are chances that there could be decline and that could be dangerous because a large country like China, if there is some kind of instability, okay, it could lead to foreign invasion. Just like in 1962, Mao had been sidelined by the next generation of leaders and Mao wanted to assert his leadership and he did that by invading India. Okay, it was Mao's decision to invade India and, and he was in full control of the People's Liberation Army. So, Xi Jinping, if he gets into trouble, is if there is some protest against him, if there is some serious challenge to his leadership, he could also launch uh, a foreign uh, attack in order to uh, uh, you know, raise ultranationalism in society so that people uh, stand behind him against a foreign country. It can happen against Taiwan, it can happen against India. You can see the border incidents that are happening in India. So, so this is the kind of a nature of a one party dictatorship. Okay, it can be very, very dangerous. So, we need to understand the system and, and, and uh, have a good understanding of China. Thank you. Traditional Chinese thought is based on the Confucian cosmology. So, it is named after Confucius, but this cosmology is a product of generations of Chinese thinkers. And to an extent, even today in China, a kind of uh, a Confucian uh, mindset exists, although it has changed because of the communist revolution. So, uh, according to the Confucian cosmology, at the top is heaven or Thian. Thian is at the top, then below is the earth, heaven at the top, earth at the bottom, in the middle is the sun of heaven. Thian Tzu is the sun of heaven, the Chinese emperor or in modern parlance we will say the Chinese state. So according to the Confucian cosmology, the Chinese state is a, an intermediary between heaven which is the truth, the cosmic law and us that is uh, the people on earth. So, state plays a very important role in Chinese thinking and at the center of this whole state system that exists on this earth is Chung Kuo, the Chinese nation. Chung Kuo is the Chinese nation at the center. In the middle is Qing, the capital where the government resides. Thank you.